worse and refused to sit on the back of the bus. She changed the ride for all of us. Oh, that's the power. Millions of hearts. Oh, that's the power of one. One grain of sand can turn the tide. One single spark can light the night. One simple dream, one gentle word, one act of love from someone. Stones he didn't judge. He moved the world with the strength of his love. Oh, that's the power of one. Good morning and welcome to another edition of uh, Inclusion St. Louis Speaker Series. This would be our seventh um, edition and so far it has been um, as uh, hopefully engaging as we had hoped for it to be. We see our audiences continue to grow and I want to thank you all for taking time to join us and, and be part of this pertinent conversation that should um, educate, inspire us um, to, to help build uh, a more inclusive uh, St. Louis. Uh, my name is Ari Obenson, a president and CEO of the International Institute of St. Louis. So you all know the International Institute has as a mission 
to build a more connected and productive society to benefit immigrants, their families, and the wider community. We do this with a desire to build um, a diverse, inclusive, and thriving community. That's our vision. And it is within the scope of that vision that we started this Inclusion St. Louis um, speaker series as a way to connect people, to build bridges, and to inspire, to build, to, to build, connect our various cultures, build bridges, and also um, inspire action. Today, we are, we are thrilled to have um, with us, we are going to be talking today about housing. I started out as president and CEO of the International Institute um, in February, and in almost every conversation that we've had about the resettlement of refugees or um, the opportunities for immigrants we've run into this challenge. Housing is a challenge to inclusive growth. And that's the theme that we're going to be exploring uh, today with our, our team of panelists. So I'm going to begin by welcoming, we have a great speaker, uh, guest speaker today, uh, who is the Chief Real Estate Investment Officer and Senior Vice President of the Greater St. Louis Inc. Join me in welcoming Dustin Allison. As our panelists today, we are going, uh, Dustin, thank you for joining us. Today we have three panelists. Um, the first is the president and CEO of Beyond Housing, an organization that is doing amazing work in this community. And we're, we're going to get the opportunity to learn um, more about that. Join me in welcoming Chris Krimoyer. Thank you, Chris, for, for joining us. We also have um, the Executive Director of Caring Ministries, Inc., um, who is uh, none other than Cyril Lum. And Cyril is going to, Cyril, thank you for joining us. We're also going to be learning about the, the incredible work that your organization did. We also have um, Maria Yasek, who is a realtor and, and founder of Comunidad St. Louis, Comunidad STL, um, who is also going to be joining us. And it's really going to be talking about her experience of many years in the real estate field in this community, working with the immigrant population. Maria, thank you for, for joining us. But good morning to you all. But just before we dive into the conversation that we're going to have it, we'll be having, um, we, we wanted to start with the perspective of Greater St. Louis Inc. that is um, working towards addressing these challenges. And so we are lucky to have with us today, um, Dustin Allison. So Dustin, can you tell us how you are tackling the housing challenge? Uh, what are some solutions that you have uh, for us before we go into the, the different perspectives that we have around the table? Yeah, absolutely, and and thank you, Ari, for uh, for inviting us to to come and and share what we've been working on uh, at Greater St. Louis Inc. Um, you know uh, from our conversations that it, at Greater St. Louis Inc., inclusive growth is at the hallmark of everything that we're trying to accomplish uh, as a regional uh, economic development organization and, and civic organization uh, for St. Louis. Um, and you cannot help to solve uh, inclusivity without addressing housing. Um, one of the tools at our disposal at Greater St. Louis Inc. is a rather large real estate investment fund, um, which I help to manage for the fund's investors. Uh, it's a little under $200 million uh, that is dedicated to uh, providing a source of flexible capital to help solve real estate problems in the city of St. Louis. Uh, you know, and with respect to residential real estate issues, um, you know, what are those problems? Well, um, do we have an aging housing stock? Um, we have uh, areas that need infill development. Uh, we have affordability issues. Um, and we want to ensure diversity of our housing stock as well, just, uh, just to name a few of those, those issues. Those aren't unique to St. Louis, let's be honest. Those are, those are issues that many communities face. Uh, so what we at Greater St. Louis have done uh, is, is to start really deploying our investor capital in 
residential opportunities that we think help to vindicate some of those uh, those problems or help to solve some of those problems that, that we've identified. Um, we've done that uh, now to, the, to about $18 million all in um, of, our, of our fund so far. Uh, and we're, we continue to look for other opportunities uh, to invest uh, investor capital to help grow St. Louis. Um, well, just of that 18 million, about 14 million has gone into, um, into driving affordable uh, new housing development. So what does that mean? Um, you know, often in residential real estate, all the new stuff is really expensive. Uh, and as product ages, it goes down uh, the, the kind of uh, cost structure. Uh, and so those things that are the most affordable tend to be the most aged products or, uh, or, or um, otherwise in some way less desirable in terms of the product that we're providing to our residents. So we at Greater St. Louis, what we've tried to do is flip that a little bit and say, you know, when we, when we invest in a particular uh, housing development, we want you to set aside a certain number of units uh, and it varies depending on the deal. Uh, and, and we wanna to try to drive those prices down and make those income contingent units. Um, that way we can open up new product to a population that might not otherwise be able to experience that new product because of the affordability gap. Um, and so we've done that now in two large uh, developments where we, put, where, where we made multi-million dollar investments into their development in exchange for driving affordability within that development. And we hope to continue to do that uh, in, in, as we go forward. Um, we have some other developments where we're just holding the land for a developer and, uh, and hoping to infill uh, with, uh, with um, market rate or other affordable uh, housing units. Um, and so that's, you know, I think progressively on the residential real estate side, that's what we're gonna continue to try to identify is opportunities for us to help drive affordability, help to, you know, diversify the housing stock, refresh our housing stock and infill some of the development gaps uh, in the city of St. Louis. Uh, it's a limited tool. Uh, it's, uh, it's not gonna solve every problem. Uh, we need to bring more resources to bear uh, to help uh, deal with this problem. Uh, certainly, uh, but I think, you know, in, in the one that we've uh, announced so far in Forest Park Southeast, we're putting in uh, with our developer partner, Green Street, 160 some odd units in Forest Park Southeast, over half of those units are income restricted. Uh, so 80 of those units, about 80, 82 of those units are going to be income restricted to make that new housing stock more affordable for, for folks. So that's one of the things this community is trying to do to help solve this problem. I think we often think of uh, you know, some of our, our problems in St. Louis is being that ah, nobody's working on it. They just continue to kind of persist and, uh, and, and, and nobody really kind of gets uh, any momentum on it. I think we got a panel here today and, and I think what Greater St. Louis is doing is, is hopefully going to show uh, that we, there are folks who are working very hard every day uh, to address some of these concerns that are not unique to St. Louis, but, but are certainly some things that we have to address in St. Louis. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet. Thank you very much, uh, Dustin, um, uh, for that. This is this is really important. Uh, you know, you mentioned a few things. The the new stock uh, is is usually the most expensive, and sometimes we at the International Institute, as we we seek to resettle people in housing, um, our challenge is that what we are finding is typically um, for it to be affordable is typically not in the best. Uh, state that it, it can be. And uh, we try, we, we, we keep trying to do our best to put um, our, our, the, 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 the people who come to St. Louis in the best housing possible. I, I must confess that sometimes it's never the best and, and, and it's a challenge that we continue to deal with. And I hope that we're going to uh, touch, on, touch on, that, on that subject. But uh, obviously, um, it shows that there is there is effort being made. There is work being done. Um, we are not yet there. There is room for progress. But let me turn to our panelists now, and I will start with with the the question that I always start this this conversation. And I'm going to just open it to any any one of you. Um, is that I always start by asking this question: Is an inclusive Saint Louis possible? If yes, um, how? Uh, if no, why not? And anyone, anyone can take a shot at, at that as, as part of your opening. Uh, well, this is Chris. I'll, I'll get started. Of, of, of course, it's possible, right? The question becomes, 
you know, as a region, how do we come together, right? Um, you know, uh, Dustin laid out some 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 interesting tools and some and some very, uh, you know, I think uh, really exciting tools that Greater Greater St. Louis is bringing to bear, right? To be intentional about and speak to this idea of uh, inclusivity. But as a region, we have to make it a priority collectively. Uh, we have to allocate resources to that end, right? You know, if uh, if uh, if uh, they say the a budget is a moral document, right? Well, where where do our collective budgets go, and what's important to us as a region? You know, we at Beyond Housing believe uh, that as a region, we can only progress so far if we keep leaving so many behind. So the, to the extent that we make this important and then uh, pass the, uh, the the rhetoric, then we start allocating resources to say, yes, not only is it important in, in how we discuss it, it's important in terms of how we allocate dollars to that end. So yes, it's possible, but it's going to take all of us in the region to say, yes, this is important to us collectively, and we're going to work toward that common goal together. Thank you collective action is necessary. Uh, Maria? Well, I, I, I definitely think it's, it's possible. I, we have to look at the positive side of life. And, um, but we have to um, have a lot more conversations and, and some changes to be applied because the reality is that within our society currently, there is a lot of, um, uh, there's some racialization, racial, racializations happening. I mean, we allocate um, a lot of value into the income, wealth, uh, uh, quality of schools, and social status. And unfortunately, um, um, we're talking also about the, the issue that you discussed last time is health. You know, there is still. Um, a divide, an unequal um, racial divides in that, and unfortunately, uh, we do need to to um, we do have a lot of um, partners, I think, in trying to uh, uh, stabilize a bit of more that divide. And but I think we still need to have a lot more conversations and um, come to a little bit more of a awareness how much it really affects our communities, especially our immigrant communities when we still um, segregate uh, neighborhoods and they don't have access to good schools. I mean, to me, housing and schools to me are, are essential for our, the progress of our society as a whole. And unfortunately, there's a lot of divisions between who can afford that and who can't. Yeah, thank you very much, Maria. I think this is this is the crux of this conversation, and I, I know we'll we'll come back to figure out some of the ways in which we can we can provide solutions to 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 these issues that you you have highlighted. Um, Syria, is an inclusive San Luis possible? Yeah, yes, definitely. I mean, for me to say no would be uh, hurting my own city. Uh, so I, I do believe I hope in my city, and I believe that is definitely. Uh, possible? How is it, I think, our voices, we need to start hearing the most marginalized, we need to start listening to them, because there's not products out there, right? Uh, we haven't given them an opportunity to fit our system. We have created a system and have said that they will morph into our system without an education piece. And meaning that, so individuals that are walking along these families, and speaking for me, immigrants and refugees families, aren't really um, learned or educated enough in regards of how to relate to them per se, right? Uh, because if we are able to relate to them and understand where they're coming from and where they need to go, we can actually walk alongside them and put them in that place, which brings St. Louis to be inclusive. Uh, so I think we need to start doing more listening and, and having individuals in the various entities and agencies, uh, the individuals are willing to listen and hear and how to drive uh, the families towards what they are possible and what create a model for them, really create a model that maybe is not anywhere else that could actually have these families feel as though they belong in St. Louis and not in disadvantaged neighborhoods, but in neighborhoods that we all want to live in. Yeah, it seems, it seems like we, we all aspire for, for a more inclusive St. Louis. And the question is, um, if this is what we aspire, what is, what is holding us back? And so I, I want to begin the, the conversation with, let me, let me turn to, to you, Chris, and to, to look a little bit about what you, I know you've been working on for, for many, many years. 
Um, obviously, building an inclusive St. Louis uh, touches all aspects of life, as, as Maria um, raised, from healthcare to food access to education to the environment and even much more. Um, but that seems to be encapsulated even in the in the, in the name beyond housing, right? <laughs> and so, um, tell, how, what is the perspective of beyond housing in in addressing the housing challenge, but looking at it really from a, a more holistic perspective? Sure. Sure. So, look, we're. We're, we're of the opinion that unless we tackle all those issues that work in successful parts of our region, right? People want to live in places, as Maria said, that have successful schools, that have strong housing stock, that have you know, no worries about public safety, that the infrastructure is good and economic development activities are thriving, right? And again, uh, that only happens in certain places, right? In certain places, um, uh, uh, those families and those communities thrive. And those that don't have those things and we as a region don't invest in them, invest in both those communities and the families that live there, we see what happens, right? We see the schools that don't serve our children well, right? We see the housing stock that begins to deteriorate. We see valuations of housing stock and then the tax base for those places go down, right? It's not rocket science here. It's really pretty straightforward, right? If we, if we invest in places as a region we have not invested in, and we all know where those places are in the region, guess what will happen, right? Housing stock will get better, Communities will get a little bit better. Uh, families are going to be more engaged and stakeholders in their children's public education success. Schools get better. Again, all this works. It's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not hard. It just takes a lot of resources to get it done. Right? And as a region, we're, we've become accustomed to this notion of scarcity. Oh, well, we just don't have the resources to do those important things. And I allege as a region, we got a lot of resources. We just don't allocate them in the places where the greatest needs are for us as a region to be everything that we want to be. So our work for the last you know, 15 years or so in this community where we work in and entering suburbs of North St. Louis County is all about understanding the connectivity between all of those pieces and being very intentional about how they fit together, right? It's not just housing alone, it's not jobs alone, it's not education alone. Again, all these things have to fit together intentionally, right? And they work in places with resources and places that, that today are successful. They do not work in places that are struggling. And again, I don't wanna oversimplify this and says it's just about resources, but here's the reality, a lot of great organizations doing great work that if they had more resources, they could build their capacity, they could grow their ability to meet the multifaceted needs that uh, people in place need in the St. Louis region. So again, it's it, I don't think when you, when you describe the idea of home, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about this idea of home. When you ask people about, tell me about you know, you know the, the first home that you remember, and what were those characteristics that allowed you and your family to be successful? Well, let's replicate that kind of stuff all throughout St. Louis because we can. We quite quite frankly, we really can. We know how to rehab houses. We know how to do programs. We know how to, again, provide economic, all the stuff we know how to do if, as a region, we had the collective courage to say, we need to invest in those places where, at least in St. Louis, that longitudinal um, historic racism has long been uh, in place and now has done great damage over time. We can change the narrative of this region if we collectively decide to do so. Thank you very much, um, uh, Chris, for that. I, I'm, I'm going to come back to you to, to, to really figure out yeah, what is stopping us from doing that. Why, why are we unable to do it? But I want to, I want to uh, turn to, to Cyril here uh, to, to talk a little bit about his work that, you know, caring ministries helps low income uh, families, immigrants, and refugees achieve self-sufficiency by helping them access affordable and sustainable housing. Now, so you're working with these people, Syria. What are some of the biggest challenges you face in advancing this mission that you that you have? And as part of this conversation, do, do you see any opportunities that that we can explore as a community? To be able to address uh, address this, and I know you mentioned a bit of this in your in your opening, but what are, what are some of the real challenges that you face when working with, with with your your audience? So yeah, I mean, what Chris said about resources is, yeah, I mean, you have to start there, right? Uh, 
great heart, great mission, know how to do it, can relate to the people and make impact where impact is needed. But the capacity in regards of the lack of resource hinders us from doing that growth, right? Um, so that bringing it back to just the challenges that are faced. I mean, here, here you are, you have families that are, are new, of course, in this region or low income and the, the understanding of our, of our way to get home ownership is so, so vast. So there's a huge education piece in, in noting just start with credit scores, right? Credit scores. So who, who are the agencies out there that can really comprehend and understand what a credit score really is and how to build that? Because when they first come here, and as Chris said earlier on, when you're looking at housing, you have to look at the full picture. And that's why we say sustainable in St. Louis, uh, because there's more than just housing that one needs to really uh, get there. Uh, so when you're looking at that, you start seeing that where are the groups, the agencies that really are able to tailor and work with these people, uh, work with these individuals, because it's not going to take uh, two, three months, four months, five months. These are going to take years of building relationships, walking with them and seeing that there are hiccups down the road and not maybe putting it at a number, right? Sometimes for us as agencies, we see all the numbers, but I, I, I build caring ministers in the sense of, I don't see the number. I see the impact of a person. I see an individual that becomes sustainable, right? So when I'm looking at the challenges, I'm seeing from my organization standpoint, resources, I'm seeing that, okay, uh, about 20%, home prices have, have lifted up about 20%. So if I'm trying to put families into homes, what areas am I trying to put these families into homes? So I put them in areas that create success for them. Well, if we look at St. Louis right now, it's sad to say, but those areas isn't what creates success for them, right? We're putting them in a place of failure, right? We're not putting that, we're putting them and sometimes we forget about them. And that's why sometimes I call the peoples I work with the forgotten people. Uh, why are they forgotten? Because we placed them and said, okay, awesome. But now we have to come and walk alongside them. We, if we are there in St. Louis, we have a great opportunity that perhaps we've missed. So these individuals are new to the system, but they're willing to be educated. They're hardworking individuals. So we have to come alongside them. Yes, resources are lack. So what would be helpful is uh, banks, I mean, opening doors for us to be able to get more capital to provide resources. But also what's huge is these neighborhoods, these neighborhoods that has great education system, great bus lines. Let's be able to have access to these properties to be able to place the families in there. But right now, we can't, we have to place them in dilapidated properties, meaning failure schools, meaning that now we're creating generations that are actually been hindered. So we have actually hurt the cycle that we said we brought them here for a great future and we've actually taken them backwards. Well, thank you very much, Cyril, for that, for that perspective, especially as we are, you know, as we, as you talk about this and we think about the effort that has been made to make St. Louis more attractive so that we can attract more immigrants to come here and be part of this community and help us build, we need to be able to work as a community to bring together the resources that will enable them to be successful to your point. We don't want to bring them here and then set them up for failure. Um, so this is, um, um, it, this is an opportune time to be having this conversation. Uh, and uh, Dustin, please feel free to jump in when, when you, you, you want to. But let me first go on to Maria so that we learn a little bit about how work. And Maria, I, I understand you're part of the um, inclusion advisory group of the St. Louis um, uh, Association of Realtors. Uh, what is the group doing uh, to uh, advance inclusion for all and, and specifically for the foreign born community in regards to access uh, to housing? The inclusion group, their main objective is to age education. I mean, we have, we serve um, the realtors, right? And so we have had um, numerous um, training sessions. Like right now we have what's called, uh, uh, there's a simulation um, program. Uh, fair, it's called Fair Housing. Uh, and, and the whole purpose is for the uh, realtors to um, 
go through the um, the simulation where they have to buy and represent and and represent sellers and buyers and and really get a feedback as to their decisions in regards to discriminatory actions, um, their their way of uh, luring them to another different neighborhood where uh, might be discriminatory. Um, so it is mainly our role is to educate our our community, our realtors. We do have a, a code of ethics that we have to uh, fulfill and every um, two years we have to renew our our um, our accreditation and, and of course our license and one of the requirements is that we have to retake that code of ethics class you know and if we all follow the what is in place I think we we can definitely uh, reduce any discriminatory um, our actions that can can take place and and more importantly when it comes to the uh, foreign born community is bringing an awareness as to the cultures that they're dealing because i mean we cannot um treat e everybody the same and we all have uh, especially as foreign born we have our different um ways of uh, processing and acting and i think that awareness is something that we're really trying to push and and sensitivity know to to the issue of home buying and which is a very complex area i mean i cannot um uh, uh, put it in uh, in um in words how complex it is and for them to really get educated as to what what is expected of them and what is the community able to do for them yeah, yeah thank you very much um maria i i, I think one or two people have commented about um, the volume from your end. I can hear you clearly, but apparently the, the audience, so you may you may want to uh, check the, the volume. Um, with that, Dustin, I'm not sure whether you wanted to add anything to, to, to this uh, based on what you're hearing. But. Uh, it was a mute. Um, no, I mean, I think, you um, just to reiterate kind of the thoughts that we have on at, at GSL, um, you know, I think, you know, to the extent that we, we can provide uh, a helpful tool to, to convene uh, conversations and try to help uh, identify resources and additional resources that may be able to bring to bear to this problem, such as our real estate fund, which is just one tool. Um, it's going to take many tools, I think, to solve these problems. Uh, Chris is, is a is an expert at bringing diverse uh, sources of funding together to try to solve problems around this and has been doing it for a long time. It's going to take a, a community to do that. Um, but I think that we have the possibility to, to really start to make some, some inroads uh, on refreshing our housing stock and, uh, and on ensuring affordability and doing so in the city of St. Louis and in the rest of the region. Um, I, I'm, I'm, op I'm as optimistic as everybody else. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing it. That's for sure. So. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it seems like we, you know, affordability is one thing. We also um, know that there are some discriminatory practices that, that uh, are a barrier. Um, we, we also know that cultural differences could be a barrier. We're beginning, we see um, large families coming in and, and sometimes even the, the units that are being constructed or available um, are not adapted to, to the reality of this family and even even local uh, laws. But, but let me I just want to go back to, to, to Chris and say we, we, we see what we know the challenges and you have been working in this area and can, uh, an, an authority here. Those challenges exist. We, 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 we think that we know the, the solutions. Um, but as you have worked in this field, what do you see as, as what is holding us back as a community to be able to work together towards finding uh, the answers uh, to, this, to this crisis? Well, I, I think what we need to understand and acknowledge is um, that we're all connected together, right? Yes, you can individually move to a place that you're pleased and happy with, but as a region, if we keep leaving so many big swaths of, 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 of this community behind and underinvested as a region, we're never gonna be who we wanna be, right. right? So unless we, yes, individually, of course, you, you can move and go where you wanna go. But as a region, if we don't say, if we don't invest in places to make them strong and healthy and vibrant into the future, 
then we're really fooling ourselves relative to as a region, how can we grow? And that, and for us, it's, 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 it's again, this idea of and our methodology is called ask, align and act, right? So we ask the people who live in this community today, tell us about the place that you call home. What's working, what's not working. More importantly, what are the solutions to make it be everything that you want it to be? So as an example, and then we align the resource and we get it done. So as an example, um, you know, over, over a decade ago, this community said, there's no grocery stores here, right? The proverb, proverbial food desert. Well, we figured out, let's cobble together resources and we built a 16,000 square foot save lot that now provides, again, fresh, fresh food at reasonable prices to folks in community. Then folks said, we don't have a bank in this community. We have all these check cashing and payday lenders. Uh, then we were able to work with Midwest Bank Center and we have a full service branch in our community. And then our folks said, hey, there's no place for entertainment opportunities. How can we find entertainment opportunities in our community versus having to leave all the time to those other neighborhoods who are fully resourced and leave our money there? So we built a, a movie theater, the 24 one cinema, four screens, 275 seats. Then our folks said recently, we have no place to sit down to eat. So a week ago, we opened up Carter Commons, which is a food hall with three restaurants. We'll have a pub in about 90 days, a clothing boutique in about 30 days, a fitness center in about 60 days, and a community kitchen upstairs where we can train young folks uh, how to get into culinary arts because folks also said we want our young folks to have real opportunities to be successful in life right so it's again about listening to the voice of the community and certainly for again the the the, the refugee community and, and the immigrant community there are certain things uh, that, that are important to them listen to their voice right if they need four and five bedroom units and let's talk about that and say well how do we produce them and how does that happen are there other things from a cultural standpoint that are important for folks right ask the question align the resources and then get it done. As a region, look, we are so philanthropic in the region. The question is, where, where do those dollars go, right? And, and, and what I'm suggesting is, um, God bless our institutions in this region because we need them to be successful. Last I checked, their balance sheets were really pretty strong. Uh, I would suggest that a bunch of our institutions, um, academia and others, don't need any more money for a while that if they want to be part of a region that is healthy and vibrant and successful so they can draw students so they can draw again tourists here invest in all the stuff that we've been talking about this morning right invest in place invest in people because we know how to do this right no more research needs to be done on hey if we do early childhood it's good for kids we know that to be true right if we invest in housing to create home ownership opportunities we know that's good for families who live in home ownership units and it's good for those communities so as a region let's do it Let's convince ourselves together that if we want to stop bemoaning, oh, woe is us, why aren't we who we want to be? Well, let's invest in the things we know will be successful long term. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chris. Um, just, you know, anybody on the panel wants to add to, to that conversation as to why we are being held back? I also want to say that we're we're having se several questions come up on in our question and answer section that we're going to be taking. I also want uh, you know when at the beginning I didn't acknowledge and welcome those who are joining us via Facebook. Um, um, thank you for for joining us as well, and and please stay engaged. Um, we have a question here from from Natalie Bishop. And it's and her question is is essentially she she she's looking she's planning to move to the North Hampton uh, for in the city and she wants to know is there anything I can do she directly or indirectly to be a positive part of the housing dynamic as a buyer or seller I think this is an important question where um, individual responsibility is important and I'm not sure. Um, which one of you would want to address uh, Natalie Bishop's question? I'm hoping, Maria, you, since you deal with uh, this, uh, whether you want to talk yeah, about that, how, how, how our, our individual decisions that we make, how can that play a part in addressing this housing challenge? To, to... I think um, the biggest uh, issue right now is the affordability. You know, affordability is a key component and, and of course, regulations, you know, because uh, if and when um, your uh, credit score, going back to that, is not very strong, uh, the possibility of you having um, a, a good type of loan 
is going to uh, hinder your possibility, especially in this current market. Um, I have a I have had a hard time getting contracts accepted because they're FHA. In other words, they're um, backed by the Federal Housing Authority. Um, the contracts that I've been accepted mainly are cash and conventional loans. So, as an individual, you want to have uh, you want to save as much as possible. You know, stop going to Starbucks. You know. Uh, if you just stop really regulating your, your expenses, you know, uh, you can achieve it, but you have to have um, FHA loans are great, I think, but I think sometimes in this current market is penalizing the people that really need that housing. Furthermore, uh, we have a very short uh, inventory. I mean, it used to be that in a balanced market, you have to have about four to six months of supply. And at Hampton, and that's not going to happen that much. I mean, right now we have in July the the housing market was offering about 1.8. I mean, uh, months of uh, in inventory. Do you see the big discrepancy of it? And and of course, some sellers are taking advantage of this and and hoping to get the best price. And most offers that we are taking are above asking price. I mean. Uh, everybody is offering 10, 20, 30, 50, 100,000, depending on the on the locality. We're seeing crazy, crazy offers, you know, and, and of course, the, the terms are important. As I said, that your credit score, what kind of loan you have, um, and even FHA, again, it penalizes uh, people. And, and then uh, with FHA, you have what's called that insurance, that PMI that you have to have. And that's for the whole length of the loan. So the, the person that doesn't have the money, it gets penalized in that regard too. So I, again, save as much as possible so you don't have to qualify. You can qualify for a conventional loan and, and cut down on your um, expenses that are not necessary. You know, So then you can put up a long, much bigger down payment and you know that, that looks more appealing to, to sellers. Yeah, yeah. Th thank, thanks, Maria, for, for that. I hope that uh, that helps um, um, Natalie with her question. I, 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 you know, we we can not discuss housing without discussing gentrification, especially um, here in St. Louis. Um, we know that investing in housing and other forms of economic development in the area increases. Unfortunately, cost of living displaces residents. Uh, who can no longer afford to live there? How do we, how do we, how do we overcome this? And and, and Dustin, I know you, you, you know that's what you're working uh, uh, towards, uh, trying to ensure that we can have some some low income housing interspersed with with the expensive housing. But how do we make that system wide? I, you know, I think it requires, um, as as others have talked about, I, just a centering uh, anti-gentrification efforts in everything that we're doing with respect to real estate development in, in our region. Uh, we see in Forest Park Southeast, um, Washington University and BJC's, I think, very intentional approach to development in Forest Park Southeast and, and the work that Abdul Abdullah and Brian Phillips do uh, in Forest Park Southeast has really allowed that uh, neighborhood, again, it's only one, right? We got a lot of neighborhoods in St. Louis, but that neighborhood to really start to flourish in a way that uh, ameliorated some of the detrimental impacts of, of, of improving housing stock and, and really has helped to provide some additional options for legacy residents in Forest Park Southeast as, as we've uh, brought in new infill development in Forest Park Southeast. And that is the product of decision-making that was a decade ago and, and considered it persistent investment over time and interventions that that curate that neighborhood so that it is an inclusive neighborhood and so that it doesn't, um, you know, push out those that um, that see the neighborhood changing over time. And we have to find that model and pick that up within the city I'm speaking, um, but also regionally and pick that up and apply it elsewhere uh, with the same intentionality and the same persistence over time that we saw Washington University and BJC apply in, in the Forest Park Southeast neighborhood. Um, and I'm not going to say everything went perfect in the Forest Park Southeast neighborhood. I'm certain Brian and Abdul and other stakeholders are going to say, you know, we got some stuff wrong. We got some stuff right. So please don't at me. Uh, but I, I do think that that stands as, by and large, a good example of how we as a community can say, hey, 
here's uh, here's a, here's a model for doing this and doing this well as we continue to grow St. Louis and other areas. Um, you know, one of the other things actually that, that you reminded me of very um, earlier was this this sense of ha finding housing for larger families is a real struggle if we're trying to find quality housing uh, for those larger families. And one of the things that we're trying to do, you know, every developer that comes to me, they want to do studios and one bedrooms. You know, that's the new product that they want to do because they know that they can sell that and and move on to the next development. And uh, what I hear from my investors and what I hear from, from our stakeholders is, hey, we want to drive more two bedroom developments and, and potentially even larger, uh, you know, multifamily developments as, as we can as the price of our, you know, catalytic income or our catalytic investment uh, in order to provide additional options for, for these larger families. That is a real struggle to find quality housing for larger families. And it's one of the things that I think you'll see more of us uh, working on as we look at additional um, additional multifamily developments in the city. Uh, again, limited tool, but um, but we certainly are going to try to play our part in, in driving that forward. And and I look forward to working with everybody on the call and, and the folks on, on, on this team uh, to, to the extent that we can find additional ways in which to solve for that problem, because it's a real one. Uh, and, and we've got to do a better job at, at kind of incentivizing our developers to build a product that, can, that we can have for larger families. Yeah. Thank you, Boston, for that. I want to take a question from the audience, um, and this is from Larry Moore. And uh, he says, we, we, you all describe resources as the greatest need. How should resources be ot obtained? Philanthropy? If, if government would transfer existing funds from one part to another, or if new funds should be raised, where should they be raised from? income taxes, sales taxes. Do you have uh, um, any recommendations as how we could collectively raise this, this resources? This is a, a general question that is, um, I, I, you know, Cyril or Chris, and then Maria, I, I will come to you so, to, to add to that. So yeah, just to chime in there, I, I think St. Louis, we have the resources. I don't think we need to start something new. Yeah. I think we have enough philanthropists in St. Louis. There's enough dollars at play in St. Louis, kind of what Chris alluded to earlier, but it's where those dollars are being placed. And the government already has also dollars too, but where are we placing these dollars? That's really what comes to place. Um, is it being, uh, for example, my, my agency doesn't get any, right? Uh, so the little players that are doing the groundworks doesn't get any. Uh, so it's, we have philanthropy. I think that's where we push on. I think for us to make St. Louis definitely inclusive, uh, make St. Louis what it can be, we have to reach out to that. And government has to play a role in it. Uh, what that role looks like, I don't think it's inventing a new wheel. There's nothing that needs to be invented, but I think dollars need to be allocated. These kind of work that we're all doing here today as a panelist. Yeah, so, yeah, so I would add uh, yes to, 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 to get the idea of plans. But I would also say, look, from a public sector standpoint, what about we spend general revenue on housing? Like, God forbid, we actually say it's so important that we don't have to take federal dollars or these other buckets that are small and tiny and getting smaller, you know, by, by, by each, um, e each new uh, administration just because there's not enough dollars, right? So for the production of affordable housing, as an example, in the St. Louis region, the, where the money comes from is not the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. It comes from the Internal Revenue Service because we use tax credits, right? So it's not, that's not government money, that's tax credits. That, that actually gives a tax paying entity, um, you know, give, gives them credits, so we don't have to pay as many taxes. So wow, wouldn't it be interesting if we actually invested more real dollars in the production of strategic, tactical, affordable housing in the places and for the families that we as a region say are really important for our longitudinal growth. And really understand that, again, this, that we, we're so used to scarcity that we just, we, we just say it's okay. Well, it's not, right? It's not okay that our neighborhoods are struggling. It's not okay that we don't provide educational opportunities for our kids. It is not okay the violence we still see in our neighbors. I don't care if the crime rate is down, still far too much violence, right? All those things are not acceptable. And until we say these things are not acceptable and we're gonna reallocate resources and hold us collectively accountable to again, make neighborhoods stronger, improve the housing stock, make the equity of opportunity be a real thing and not just a nice catchphrase that people wanna talk about. We'll, we'll have another panel like this in 10 years talking about the same kind of stuff. 
I hope not. I hope not. I hope. I hope we would have moved forward. But Maria, you wanted to you wanted to add something to that. And I, I must say that we we have several questions um, waiting in the wings in uh, in uh, from our audience. So we'll we'll take those. But Maria, you were going to to yeah, add. I, I think one of the things that we need to do also is we got to encourage some regulations to be changed. You know, when we look at some of the homes that. Um, uh, anytime that I sell a home, I have to uh, notify how many people were living in that home. You know, and each locality regulates their, their amount of people. And the reality is that, especially with our communities, it, 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 we're just making them to be to lie, you know, because um, most of our, our families are, are, have more than two children, you know, and there should be a, a little bit more uh, leeway as to how many are allowed, especially in, uh, because of the issues of affordability. Uh, a person that has several kids cannot afford the $300, $400 home. You know, we're talking about anywhere in the under 200,000. And those uh, houses are generally no more than two bedrooms and hopefully they're three, you know, but, um, and then we gotta make sure that the basement is, is livable but then at the same time, they restrict us as how many people can live in that home. And, and we have to make sure that the regulations are, are also taking into account the affordability and what is the, the income that is really uh, adequate to receive more, more, more subsidized, you know, because the, it, the, the income ratios are not uh, adequate for, for, our, for our population and the way that it is growing and how much is increasing the cost of housing. I mean, when you look at that in 2019, you could buy an, an average home was 181,000 here in the area. Now it's 224,000. You know, we're talking about today's prices. And if you look at in the, in, from 2000 to now, uh, we're talking about 50,000 increase of value. I mean, so it's, it makes it very hard for those families that need bigger homes to be able to afford them. Yeah, but Maria, to that point, there's actually a question from Lisa Mandel that, that talks about, um, yeah, we're, we're fighting a, a, a 15 hour wage uh, increase here uh, that amounts to $30,000 per year. Uh, it's very challenging to, to buy a house um, at that income. What, what do people like that do um, faced with the circumstances? What is expected of them? The ideal thing is for a person to only spend 30% of their income in housing. That's not happening right now. A lot of people are spending over 50% of their income in housing. That is, should not be the case. And it won't work long-term. They can do it short-term, but, but it won't work long-term. No, it should yeah. not be. Yeah, I, I, so that's that. Now I, I see that the, the, there are several questions about um, so we have an anonymous question here is, are housing income restrictions set according to certain standards, e.g. Uh, federal poverty level, you know, elder index, et cetera. W what does screening look like? What sorts of demographic info is considered, if any, beyond income in, in this, in housing considerations? Um, maybe Maria, you, as a realtor, you may want to look at that. Well, again, it's your credit scores. You know, your credit scores is that, and unfortunately within our, our community, immigrant community, you know, they have to have some kind of a, a, a record, you know, his, history to say, this is your, your, your credit, uh, you know, but fortunately, and I have to say, I work with, and there are some partners in the area that will um, look at um, uh, different kinds of credit, not necessarily the ones that you see on the, on the normal market, you know, they will consider your um, record in how you pay your utilities and all that, but you still have to have some kind of a, if you're not, you're living with a family member, you can't even do that because you're not paying the utilities. So how can you be able to get out of that home where you are living with your children and your brother's or, or sister's home, you know, if you don't pay the utilities. So it, it makes it very difficult for that to build that, that credit score. And that unfortunately is a, an essential component, you know, of, of being able to, to, to get to be able to have that uh, option to, to buy or for that matter, even rent, you know, because you have to show that your ability to, to pay. 
Yeah, I, I can relate to that as an immigrant coming to this country and I, I, having to try to buy a first can paying an interest rate of 23% on the car, obviously because I had no credit history. I mean, even at the International Institute, we, we try to help educate and work with people to enhance their, 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 their credit score, but it's still very challenging, surreal. I'm sure that this is something that you, you, you encounter all the time with the people that you work with. Yeah, no, this is a huge issue. I mean, uh, the families, especially right now, I'm focused a lot in the Hudamon area. Uh, these individuals have no idea about credit. I am sending them to the several agencies. I mean, that we all know the Justin Petersons and the, the other agencies that do this kind of work. And it's great. But these families, I mean, the patience, the time it's going to take for them to get there, Beyond that, there's other things that happen in life, right? You want cars, right? You want other things. And then when they're approved, they're, I mean, we talked about it. They want to live in South City, right? They're, they're home. There's a family of seven, right? They can afford $150,000. That's what they can afford. So we can imagine that, right? And here they are. They have it. And then that's one situation. And then there's another situation where the, the credit score is just, it's going to take three, four years before that. Do they get to a point where there's frustration and they just give up? Because that's what I, I see. One of the big challenges is I've had a pool of families that believe in the vision, right? But then I send them to get towards that vision because I can't control the other components of it. And they're stuck. And that's the one hurdle that I don't know how to get over. And right now with the way the market is, I mean, I have had some, uh, some families that had gotten approved but then we can't find a home. So their, their approval is out the window because it's, it's past three months, four months, yeah. four months, and we have to restart all again the process. And it is, it is very grueling. And I have uh, many people weary, very weary, but they still want to get to, to that opportunity where they, they have a better situation for their families. I mean, they can't keep on living in, with the family members because it's, it's not, I, it can't be, it's so not yeah, so yeah. Imagine, imagine if we had a region where we had more investment in housing stock, where there were more options, right? That yes, the housing markets will get hot and cold, right? So not, right now we're hot, but imagine if we had a, other communities, other neighborhoods where from a, both a pricing standpoint, but also from a, w what's the environment of, of where this home is located that, that will draw me there. Imagine if we had more options like that and didn't only have a handful that, that folks wanted and the housing market gets hot, they're on the sidelines, you know, watching the game because they can't get in. So again, if we're ha we have the regional courage to invest in more communities, more neighborhoods and, and our regional housing stock, we could solve at least some of the problem that we're seeing today because we're seeing a whole bunch of first time home buyers that, that just can't get in the game because again, they don't have enough resources. They're getting priced out. People are getting, you know, at the, 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 no one, if you're getting asking price for your home today, you're doing something wrong because everyone's getting over asking price. Right? Exactly. exactly. So, so again, that's a, that's a housing market that's overheated and it's not sustainable. So it's gonna come back to normal at some point. But again, imagine if there are more options and, and more availability and more down payment assistance on the home ownership side, right? More, more dollars available to help people. Yeah, I can make the monthly payment, but I don't have a family member who can give me five, 10 grand um, to again, put a down payment down so I can, I, I can get a loan that makes economic sense for me, right? So there's all these things that are solvable if as a region, again, we're interested and we care enough and we think it's important enough to, to again, invest in this kind of yeah, But new construction yeah. is not affordable. I mean, a new construction is, is, is out completely the window. I mean, so yeah. it, we're back to the same problem. Yeah, let me, let me so mindful of, of our time, it's, it, it, you know, I know that this, this is a conversation that probably we need to convene. So I'm looking to Chris and Cyril and Maria and Dustin to say, how can we convene um, uh, to continue this conversation and figure out ways in which we can work together as a community. But if you had one, one wish for what this community should look towards, I would just say, let's have a minute each as we close down to just, as you're closing remarks, like what is the, the one wish that we can do as a community to move this conversation forward? And I would start with uh, Cyril. Yeah, I think uh, for me, as a wish to move th this conversation forward is uh, players to come across and start working together. Uh, when I started in 2011, they said nonprofits don't like working together. 
That's what the former CEO of Employment Connection shared with me. And I think that's where it starts. Um, we have the resources, we have it. Now we have to go ahead and do something. And what does Thank that you. mean? The key players come together, talk how that looks like, and we move on it because we have Thank it you. already. Thank you, Cyril. Let's walk together, uh, Maria. My biggest dream would be for affordable housing in districts, school districts that are uh, impactful in the lives of families. I mean, we still are blocked and un unavailable to be enter to those markets where the school districts are top notch. School districts, education key. Dustin? Um, I would say let's get out of our own way. Um, we have a tendency in St. Louis to get in our own way. Let's um, take a little bit more risk than maybe we've done in the past and start figuring out how do we solve these problems a little bit differently. And then let's celebrate the wins and stop, you know, like hand wringing about everything that's gone wrong and start talking about what's starting to go right. Um, yeah. So those are the those are the things that I think. Like like the incredible examples that Chris raised here. <laughs> Chris, sure. what what would what, what you, your closing uh, remarks here? Be bold and audacious. Look, have the courage to, to we'll use our beloved Cardinals. Let's swing for the fences, right? Come on, we've been we've been nickel and diamond this forever, and look where it's gotten us, right? We've hoped that things get a little bit better. We've sprinkled a few resources here. We get comfortable with work that's transactional. Let's do work that's transformational. Let's be bold, innovative, and audacious, uh, and swing for the fences. Thank you very much. Let's be transformational and, and audacious in, in our outcomes. I know that we couldn't take, we kind of took most of the questions that came. We couldn't take all, but I want to thank you all for, for, for being here. Um, the, we are, our, next week, we're going to be talking about um, communication, how we communicate in ways that could be more inclusive. And we'll have some great panelists here talking about that words uh, mean something. So we'll talk about that next week. Let me just plug in the Festival of Nations. The grand finale for 2021 will be on August 28th from 11 to 8 p.m. at the Nine Mile Garden. We we'll look forward to you joining all. If you want a booth, you want to participate one way or the other, uh, please join us. And, uh, and I want to thank everybody for being here. Those of you on Facebook, those who participated here, thank you for your contribution, your questions. Um, we look forward to joining you. We look forward to you joining us next Monday as we continue this conversation of inclusion, St. Louis. Thank you. Have a wonderful Thank you, everybody. Week. Thank and you. we will stay connected with each one of you. Thank you. Thank you.